In a 1963 edition of Vogue that also trumpeted the 60s as the pink decade in fashion, the magazine described some of Shannon's early contraptions, from a chairlift that took his kids 600 feet down from the house to Mystic Lake, to the hidden panel in his library that sprung open but didn't lead anywhere. The fact is he loved engineering things, you know, the gadgets that he kept around his house, the mechanical mouse, the, the chairlift from his house down to the lake. I mean, that was an integral part of his, uh, his uh, you know, psyche, his mentality. He built more than 30 unicycles by hand in his garage. You know, one of his uh, questions was uh, that intrigued him was how small a unicycle uh, could a human ride. And he had several that were, no one had ever ridden. Shannon was an inveterate tinker and inventor. One room in his house was crammed with dozens of his devices, a computer that could calculate in Roman numerals, a machine that could solve the Rubik's Cube puzzle, a gasoline-powered pogo stick, and several mechanical juggling machines. Shannon himself took up juggling with a vengeance, a sport he later demonstrated for this Canadian broadcasting documentary. He also wrote a widely praised academic paper on the dynamics of keeping multiple objects in the air at the same time. Generally, if a guy is, comes up with all those things, here's a mouse that does a maze and this and that, and you know, I sort of think he's showing off that he's Mr. Idea Man. Uh, but he was so quiet and unassuming and humble, then I think that he was doing these little things despite himself rather than to show off. Stanford professor Thomas Cover won the Shannon Award in 1990 in part for his work extending information theory into investment analysis. Shannon never published on the subject but delivered two influential lectures at MIT on stock investing, predating widespread use of portfolio theory on Wall Street. He and Betty Shannon also made a killing in the stock market after investing in technology startups owned by friends, companies such as Teledyne and Hewlett Packard. Like playing the stock market, games and game theory also appealed to Shannon. One of uh, Shannon's connections that is little known was uh, that uh, Ed Thorpe, the guy who became famous for writing the book Beat the Dealer, how to play blackjack optimally and count the cards, Apparently, one summer he had gone out to, he'd, he'd talked to Shannon and he asked whether Shannon would submit his work on blackjack to the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And Shannon got interested and before long he ended up going out to Shannon's house and uh, working on a roulette prediction. In 1973, on the 25th anniversary of Shannon's landmark paper, the Information Theory Society, within what is now called the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, instituted an annual Shannon lecture that evolved into the Shannon Award. UC Berkeley professor Elwin Burlicamp, a later recipient of that award, invited Shannon to deliver the first lecture. I've never seen such a case of stage fright. Of course, once he got on stage, you know, and got after the first line or two, he did a fantastic job, and there, there was no problem. He had been out of information theory for certainly five and maybe the better part of ten years at that point, felt that uh, there was little that he uh, had any right to talk to this uh, group of eminent people about. He just felt that people were going to expect so much of him in this talk and he was afraid that he didn't have anything significant to say. Uh, needless to say, he gave a fantastic talk and but in my mind it just showed me what a modest man he was. Even after retiring from MIT in 1978, Shannon could never completely escape his fame within the engineering community. Uh, Shannon is a hero of mine. Caltech's Bob McLeese says it was as if Newton had showed up when Shannon attended a 1985 meeting in Brighton, England. People lined up to get his autograph. Uh, people don't, physicists don't line up to get other physicists' autographs, I don't think. I think it just, he was just so far uh, beyond of what the rest of us were capable of doing, we just got, there were photo opportunities. Despite his fundamental achievements, Shannon never won a Nobel Prize. He would have won it years ago, but his, his work is in mathematics and engineering. There is no Nobel Prize in mathematics and engineering. But, but, in about 1980, the mid-80s, 84, 85, the Japanese government 
uh, created a prize called the Kyoto Prize, which was supposed to be uh, a, a mirror of the Nobel Prize. Monetarily, it's more money. Shannon won the first Kyoto Prize. Shannon gave his last major interview to Omni magazine in 1987. By the late 1980s, Shannon made fewer appearances and friends began noticing signs that he was grappling with a terrible condition, Alzheimer's. When the former Bell Labs buildings in Florham Park, New Jersey, were rechristened the AT&T Shannon Laboratories in 1998, Shannon was in a nursing home too sick to attend. When his hometown of Gaylord, Michigan put up a statue in his honor in October 2000, Shannon's wife Betty stood in for him. A few months later, in February 2001, at the age of 84, Shannon lost his long battle with Alzheimer's disease. To celebrate that life and highlight advances in information theory, the winner of the 2001 Shannon Award, Jack Wolf, organized a Shannon Symposium. Wolf is a professor at UC San Diego's Jacobs School of Engineering. The conference at the Center for Magnetic Recording Research on the UCSD campus featured presentations by 14 world-renowned thinkers and practitioners of information theory who came from as far away as the Netherlands. Conference goers included this graduate student who paid tribute in a way Shannon would have certainly appreciated. Shannon was truly a renaissance figure. Do it. Just pull it straight off. After the symposium, Jack Wolf also dedicated a casting of the statue originally commissioned by the IEEE Information Theory Society for Shannon's hometown, with dignitaries including Qualcomm CEO Erwin Jacobs, who studied under Shannon at MIT, in attendance. It is wonderful to recognize the fantastic contribution that he did make uh, to Information Theory, to communications, setting up everything that is now moving ahead at such a rapid pace. With Qualcomm based in San Diego and UCSD's School of Engineering named after the Qualcomm founder and his wife, the school has built a center of excellence in information theory among faculty and students unrivaled anywhere in the world. We have, within the last 10 years, hired the best and the brightest of, of the young uh, Shannon information theorists uh, in the U.S. This is the the center of gravity of information theory in, in the United States at a university. We feel very close uh, to the work of Claude Shannon. I was chatting with Toby Berger and we were talking a little bit about the communication theory and systems and coding group that's been put together here at UC San Diego. And he very kindly said, you know, for the last three or four years, if one of my students wants to go study in that field, I say San Diego is the place you should go. At the symposium, former colleagues, students, friends, and admirers discussed Shannon's legacy. There's always this historical question about if, a, if this person hadn't existed, would the world be really different? And people say, no, nah, it would always, someone else would have thought the same thing. But I don't believe that. I believe individual people make a big difference. And Shannon is, a, is, is one, of the, in the, 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 one, of the, one of the most su supreme intellects of this century. My guess is, you know, we're 10, 20 years ahead of where we would have been if, if Shannon hadn't, hadn't been there to make these discoveries. There would have just been a lot of small discoveries in the, and he presented us with this big clear picture all at once. What he did for communications and information theory in general uh, was, uh, was startling and, uh, uh, and momentous and if he hadn't come along it would probably have taken us 30, 40 years to come up with uh, probably a, uh, only a subset of his uh, invention. The world would have gone ahead. We probably would have still had the internet today. We would have had high-speed modems and, and that kind of thing. We would have had error correcting codes. Uh, but they might, have, might actually have been delayed. And, and there's almost nobody in the world you can say that about, that if that person hadn't existed, that the world wouldn't be quite like what it is today. But I, I truly believe Shannon is almost unique in that, in that sense that we wouldn't be as far along today if he hadn't lived and done what he did.